Welcome back, everyone. You've made it all the way through the day, and we're on our last talk. So while the villages are winding down, you can still stop by the networking channel and drop in your LinkedIn and Twitter to keep in touch with folks. Um, and also, Pet Picks is still full of adorable Pet Picks, so definitely stop by there. Um, we also want to remind you to stay tuned after this talk. In about 30 minutes, uh, we'll be kicking off the closing ceremony, so make sure to stick around for that as well. Um, and with that, I'm going to int introduce Elaine Harrison Newkirk. Uh, she works for Scythe. Her talk is titled Kicking Imposter Syndrome to the Curb, which I'm sure a lot of us can relate to. Um, so this talk is pre-recorded, but Elaine is actually in Discord and will be answering questions. So hop into the QA channel and uh, drop your comments and questions there. Thanks so much. And thanks again to all of our sponsors as well. My name is Elaine Harrison Newkirk, and I'm here today to talk to you about kicking imposter syndrome to the curb. This talk is about my experience, how I discovered I had imposter syndrome, and the steps I've taken to kick it to the curb. So first, a little about me. I lead the customer support program at an amazing stump startup company known as Scythe. I'm also a technical writer for Scythe. I'm the mom of three awesome young women and a bearded dragon named Taco. He's also my office mate. He's pretty chill. He comes to company meetings. The only thing we don't really like is when he decides to eat his live warm lunch on my desk. I started out as a hotel manager and then I pivoted into IT as a PC technician. I've worked my way up through my career and I've been in cybersecurity for over 10 years now. I'm also volunteer director of education for cybersecurity nonprofit. I'd like to thank the Diana Initiative for having me here today. And also I'd like to thank Alan Farinov for mentoring me and helping me with my proposal for this talk. He was super awesome and helped me a lot. So I have a couple of things for you to think about. Do you know what imposter syndrome is? And what does imposter syndrome mean to you if you do know what it is? Merriam-Webster's definition of imposter syndrome is a psychological condition that is characterized by persistent doubt concerning one's abilities or accomplishments accompanied by the fear of being exposed as a fraud, despite evidence of one's ongoing success. So for me, I don't particularly like this definition. I feel like a fraud is someone who's purposely trying to deceive other people or be deceptive. And I don't think anyone who suffers from imposter syndrome is doing that. We're not out there intentionally deceiving people. Um, I, For me, imposter syndrome is just constant self-doubt, le uh, lack of self-confidence, anxiety, and worrying about how other people see me. I found this meme in a blog about imposter syndrome and the link is in the slides. And um, I thought this was a great one for me because I do beat myself up for all of these things. I um, constantly stay up at night worrying and getting really anxious about stuff that's out of my control, stuff everyone else has literally forgotten about, like maybe a conversation I had with somebody and I lay in bed wondering, did I offend them? Do they not like me? Did I say something wrong? Did they get mad afterwards? When honestly, it was probably a four minute conversation about what we were gonna have for lunch. And they are not even thinking about that now. They're sound asleep. And then stuff that nobody else has even noticed. So as I said, in my uh, perception of imposter syndrome, I feel like self-doubt plays a huge part. Um, I, I'm sure if you do suffer, you have sat in team meetings and had these thoughts. You know, um, you may not want to speak up during the meeting because you feel like you don't know as much as your teammates do, or you don't want them to think you're incompetent. You don't want to say the wrong thing and say it sounds stupid. Um, also, you may just feel like constantly, like no matter how hard you work, you're not going to be able to prove that you're as good as everyone else that you work with. So think about this. What self-doubt thoughts do you have during meetings, in your personal life, 
during activities with other groups, maybe groups of parents or um, people in some community, in your community or a community you volunteer with? How do you, um, you know, beat yourself up with these self-doubt thoughts? And how do we keep it from happening? That's something else that you should think about. How do you keep those self-doubt thoughts at bay? So Asana's blog, Turn Imposter Syndrome into Confidence, 15 Tips for Managers and Individuals, lists a, a characteristics of imposter syndrome. Sorry, I have to move my head out of the way. And um, so these are, this is just a short list. There's actually, I'm sure, a lot of other characteristics. And I'm sure if you put pen to paper or finger to keyboard, you could come up with a list yourself. But I thought that these um, particular characteristics definitely applied to me and my imposter syndrome. Um, I used to always feel that my skills or competence were lacking. I always felt like um, I wasn't going to do something right because I didn't have this, this, the stellar skills to do it. Um, if I worked on a project and completed it and I got kudos for that, I would kind of just shrug it off and be like, oh, yeah, thanks. You know, um, it was just luck and Googling, um, just constantly worrying that you're not good enough. Or if you work remote, particularly, you may find yourself isolating yourself from team members. I still do that at times where I just kind of pull back and don't communicate with anyone. Um, perfectionism. A lot of us who suffer from uh, imposter syndrome definitely work toward perfectionism, which is really just a waste of time, in, in my opinion, I've come to realize. For example, I um, when I record talks, I record them 10 or 15 times trying to get them perfect. And now I realize no matter how many times I record them, I'm going to make mistakes. If I was doing a live talk, I would make mistakes. Um, overwork and burnout, that's something that we also suffer from, right? We're trying to prove ourselves. So we're working probably more hours than we need to. We're putting in extra time and that's going to cause you to burn out. And you know what? Most people are not going to notice that you work 60 hours in a week on a particular project or tasks. It's just going to be you who notices and then you're going to be really tired. And the next week is not going to be great because you're just burnt and done with it. Setting impossibly high standards for yourself. I don't know if it comes with age or the fact that I, I'm working toward getting rid of imposter syndrome, but I have definitely lowered the bar for standards for myself. I do not try to be perfect. I don't try to get perfect scores on tests anymore. You know, I'm just happy if I pass them now. Low self-esteem, intense fear of failure, and decreased self-confidence. These are definitely all characteristics that ruled my life for a really long time. So what other characteristics would you add to the list? That's something else that you should think about. There are actions by other people that feed your imposter syndrome. Um, so these are actions by other people that have come into my life and have fed my imposter syndrome. Being blown off, uh, giving input during meetings and people just ignore me, or they constantly interrupt me when I speak and step on my words or move on to other topics and they don't hear me. Um, authority figures, teammates, family members, teachers, all people who may put you down either intentionally or unintentionally that certainly feeds imposter syndrome. And then also these same people um, comparing you to someone who's better. Maybe you're, getting, you're in high school and you're being compared to better students who get better grades. Um, not better, but you know, students who get better grades than you, but you might be really skilled in other areas. It may not be your thing. For example, I was not great in algebra and it, I, it still isn't my thing. I think I, I just have a terrible fear of algebra. But being compared to students who are amazing in algebra didn't help with my imposter syndrome. 
what feeds your imposter syndrome? What actions do other people take that feeds your imposter syndrome and makes it harder for you to work towards moving away from it? I did some research and I tried to find studies on imposter syndrome. Um, there's really not a lot out there. I think it, there probably will be more as you know time progresses and more people know about imposter syndrome. I was able to find a few studies, most of them targeted women. I will say that men certainly suffer from imposter syndrome as, as well, but maybe it's not as out there in the open, or maybe there just aren't as many who do. So in my research, I found that women of color are highest ranking in studies, followed by trans women and women who work in male dominated industries, such as manufacturing, healthcare, and information technology or information security. The KPMG study, which is linked in this slide, noted that 75% of women executives have experienced imposter syndrome at some point in their careers. 85% um, have not talked about it because they don't want to be seen as weak. And less than 5% of employers have actually addressed imposter syndrome with their staff. So now I want to talk about how I learned about imposter syndrome and what it was. I actually did not know what this term was until two years ago, a little over two years ago when the pandemic started. And I was in lockdown. I decided I was going to turn a bad thing into something good. And I started signing up for different webinars and um, tried to really bump up my virtual networking. So I watched an imposter syndrome perspective excuse me, I watched a webinar on imposter syndrome perspectives for black women in tech. And this was sponsored by Women in Cybersecurity. It's a really awesome webinar and that is also linked in this slide for you to watch. Um, so as I watched this, I was like, holy moly, I have imposter syndrome. Now I know what it is. Now I have a name for my intense self-doubt and lack of self-confidence. Like I felt like a door had opened and I like knew how I had been feeling all these years was actually something legit. My experience with imposter syndrome syndrome started as a child. It followed me into high school and then into my professional life in IT and cybersecurity. Um, mine started out as a child. I had a family member who constantly told me I wasn't good enough. Um, this person would either actually say the words or, you know, play a lot of mind games to make me feel like I was less than I was or less worthy than I was. Um, I would do the dishes and that person would make me do them over again until I did them exactly how he wanted them. Um, just a lot of um, coming down on me that did not help me as a child feel confident in what I could do or what I knew. Um, in high school, I was a pretty decent student, but I was horrible in gym class. I was not an athlete. I was the kid that hung up the second knot of the rope and was like, hey, I can't do this. I just simply wasn't physically strong enough to climb a rope. But our gym teachers were not looking at that. They they were looking at the fact that I could not climb the rope and they made me feel really bad about myself because I couldn't. Um, honestly, I've never had to climb a rope in my life. And I think I'm sure there's a lot of other people that I was in gym class with who also have not had to. I did join a couple of sports teams. I joined soccer and I joined basketball. I ended up benched because I was not athletic and I wasn't good at it. I really didn't know what I was doing and the coaches didn't want to waste the time on me when they had star athletes that they could focus on. So that definitely did not help with my self-worth or my um, self-confidence. I basically spent my last two years in high school sitting in the computer room, typing away on my little Commodore 64 because that's where I was most comfortable and I knew I was really good at it. As I moved into IT, um, my life of being dismissed by male managers and male executives began. 
I had so many examples of times when these people who um, have been in court, working in corporate for a really long time, just walked right by me, ignored what I had to say. They, I had one person walk by me and tell my female manager that he needed me to do something rather than just coming to me and telling me. That really upset me and obviously has stuck with me. Um, I have had multiple times where I was interrupted in meetings or had my words stepped on by other male managers. Um, recommendations were ignored until male, male counterparts agreed with my recommendations and then they would get picked up. I have spoken to managers in the past and told them how I felt about how they were treating me and they promised to improve, but they didn't. Um, I had someone actually tell me I was constantly seeking recognition and I was jealous of my coworkers, which was absolutely not true. I was just trying to um, get some of the issues I had worked out with this person and um, have him not treat me the way he had been treating me. I've also had female managers who didn't stand up for me, which really did not help at all and only fed my imposter syndrome. Now, if you want to take a minute and think about times that maybe you've had interactions like this and um, did that also feed your imposter syndrome? I would assume that it did because it certainly isn't. None of these were positive interactions. So can we uh, recover from imposter syndrome? Is this something that we recover from? Or will imposter syndrome always lurk in the background? Is it always gonna be that little ugly troll sitting in the woods waiting to jump up on your shoulder and whisper in your ear and bring you down? I don't know. I'm trying to recover from it. I'm definitely not fully recovered. I still have days where that troll is clutching to my shoulder and whispering in my ear. But these are the steps that I've been taking over the past year and a half. So to start with, I left a toxic work environment. I um, finally had kind of had enough of not being listened to or um, feeling like I just didn't know what I was doing. So I found this job at Scythe and it's been really amazing. All of our management and executives support us. They encourage us to get out there and do things that we normally wouldn't do. Um, when I first started working at Scythe, my male teammates, and my male managers definitely pushed me to um, learn, to get out there, to speak up. I never, I've never been in a meeting where anybody ignored what I had to say. And they make me feel like I know what I'm doing and that I am worth being in cybersecurity. Um, I've also, at the beginning of the pandemic, found Noreen George's Mentor Mentee Women in C Cybersecurity Group. We meet uh, monthly. And it's a group of professional cybersecurity professionals, um, students, people just starting in cyber. Um, we, we just get together and we talk about what we're doing and, and if we need help from someone um, or if we need a mentor or if we're looking to mentor people. And it's really a fantastic supportive network. I actually did my first talk in Noreen's group because it was a smaller group with people that I had been with virtually for quite a while and I was super comfortable. And it helped really boost my self-confidence and uh, made me realize that I can do talks. Helping know with others overcome imposter syndrome gives me a lot of confidence. For example, me doing these talks on imposter syndrome, I really hope that I'm making a difference in some of your lives and that, um, if you don't suffer from imposter syndrome, maybe I'm helping give you tools to help other people recover. And learning new things. Um, that's something that I have been doing since I started this job at Scythe. I do not come from a software background. I was a, a blue teamer, a security analyst. So working in software development world is a whole new thing. There's a lot I need to learn, but I'm learning it. And as I learn and as I practice, I get a lot better at it. And um, I think that that's really helped boost my confidence and push that self-doubt aside as well. So I do still have times where I have doubt and I doubt my abilities and I doubt my knowledge. Uh, that little troll is just up there like, and you know what? I just flick them away and I'm like, look, 
I can do this. I am capable, I'm knowledgeable, and I'm awesome. Um, and also I need to remind myself that I'm not gonna know everything in all of the cybersecurity domains. It's, I don't think anybody can. There's so much information out there in cyber, um, but we each have our own little niche of expertise. So I'm gonna kick imposter syndrome to the curb. I'm gonna get rid of that little troll. And this is how you can do it too. You need to know your worth, know that you're amazing and worthy and knowledgeable and you know your stuff. You may be an expert in blue teaming or red teaming or purple teaming, and maybe you're, you lack uh, knowledge in, in other areas, you know, but if you have a supportive network and you surround yourself with people who support you and have knowledge in other areas, then you can reach out to them and get help and learn more. If you work in a unsupportive culture or have unsupportive managers, maybe it's time to make that change. Maybe it's time to move on to a different job. And it's okay to fail. Um, you know what, you don't, we're not always gonna be successful, nobody is. But don't beat yourself up if something doesn't go the way you wanted it to or a project you're working on is not going right. Um, there's no reason to beat yourself up. You're doing what you can, you're trying your best and you can improve, right? If you, if you work on a project that doesn't go as well as you wanted it to, think about the pieces that were lacking or the gaps and then push yourself, learn what you need to learn um, to make it successful the next time around. Don't let it get to you. And again, like I said, we don't know everything. We need to learn from people who have expertise where we don't. The people I work with are amazing. They all uh, are very knowledgeable in different areas than I am. And I have no problem reaching out to someone and asking them to either show me how to do something because I'm a visual learner or give me resources or hook me up with someone else that could help me if they don't have that knowledge or if they are really busy and don't have the time to help at that time. And all of my safe unicorns are absolutely willing to do this. Alyssa Miller wrote in Conquering Imposter Syndrome, accept that it's okay not to know all the answers and that if you did, it would mean you're not pushing yourself hard enough. Have faith that it's not only acceptable to reach out for help, but it's actually an effective tool. And I completely agree with her. Asking for help is not a sign of weakness. Asking for help means that you're looking to improve yourself and learn more. It doesn't mean that you're not good enough or you don't know enough. It just means you need a little extra boost. Put yourself out there. If you don't know, um, if you don't try, you won't ever know. If I had never submitted papers to do these talks, I would never know that I was going to be accepted. I would never know that people were going to um, find my talks useful. And it help, really has helped build my confidence. So just remember, you've got this. You need to get out of your comfort zone, try new things, um, make a list, set some goals, move away from negativity, get out away from those toxic people and toxic environments that you may be dealing with. Stand up for yourself. If you're in meetings and people are not listening to you, or if you're on, in a one-on-one -on -one and your manager is reading his or her, they, their, sorry, emails, um, you know, be like, hey, we're meeting here. Eyes up here, I'm talking. Don't let them just ignore you. And like I said before, set goals. Um, Set some small goals at first. Think about things that you want to do that you've been really afraid to do and try something. Try one little thing and be yourself. Stop worrying about what everybody else thinks. It doesn't matter. You do you. So I'm going to give you a little bit of homework. I want you to think about steps that you can take for your recovery from imposter syndrome. Make a list of uh, actions or items that you want to try that are not in your comfort goal, excuse me, your comfort zone, and set your goals. Try one thing, be successful, try another. It's eventually you're going to realize that you have kicked that little troll to the curb 
and you're doing great and you don't worry about everyone else and what they think about you anymore. I want to thank everyone for attending my talk. I really hope that I was able to um, give you some tools to help you work through this or help other people work through this. I hope you really enjoyed the conference and have a great weekend. All right. Thank you so much, Elaine, for closing us out with a great discussion on imposter syndrome. Just kind of a something that's I think pretty much everyone has. And if you don't have it, there's next KCD meme for that probably. Um, so in another uh, few minutes, actually in exactly five minutes, we're going to be rolling into closing ceremonies. So I will take this opportunity to yet again thank our sponsors, thank volunteers and uh, staff and everyone for uh, participating. Um, after closing ceremonies, I believe there will be some social uh, games. So stick around the Discord. Uh, and uh, yet again, thanks for everything. Cheers.